Hi, this is Chris with Sheepdog Church Security. And today what I have for you is a special YouTube exclusive video where we're going to be sitting down with Simon to discuss situational awareness and how it actually plays out in the church while we're patrolling, while we're working and, and walking around the grounds and, and paying attention to people in the lobby and the sanctuary. And I think you're going to find a lot of value in this. So a lot of you have watched our previous video. You've, you've met Simon. You know what he's all about. He's part of, um, he started the Worship Security Association, which in a nutshell is Netflix for, for church security. He's got all kinds of videos with subject matter experts in all kinds of topics. And it's really designed not just for the safety team, but I would say there's a special focus towards um, leadership, you know, the, the, the board members, the elders, the pastors, because some of these topics are really about legal issues or it's cultural type issues, um, things where you almost have that um, umbrella um, understanding of different topics and how it kind of filters down into how we function as a church in order to remain uh, safe and secure. So before I bring on Simon, I just want to encourage you to check out his website. Once again, it's Worship Security Association. You can Google that or whatever search engine. You're going to find it. You'll also see it in our comic section. Click on that. Go over there. Consider getting a subscription. I think you're going to be absolutely amazed by what he has to offer and the people that he interviews. These are people that most of us don't get to talk to on a regular basis, but somehow Simon's able to get in there and get these people to sit down and discuss important issues. So without any further ado, Simon, welcome. Welcome to the program again. Well, Chris, a very kind introduction for me there. Um, if I had white Caucasian skin, you'd see me blushing. My black skin hides it well, but uh, thank you. Some, some fine compliments. And I should say as well for your listeners and viewers that you have a discount code as well for being a sort of a loyal affiliate. So people should check out your link to make sure that um, they're sort of being rewarded with a discount that you've got within there. But Chris, as always, a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, you're a good friend uh, and I learned so much from you. So I'm great that we're having this conversation again. Yeah, thank you. So so the whole intent behind us getting together today is really a continuation of our conversation previously, where we kind of went off on a tangent about situational Never. Chris, awareness. Chris, would we do that? Would we go off a tangent? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I think people appreciate our tangents. <laughs> but, so I, I want to talk more with you about situational awareness and really you know, what it, what it means for us, I mean, obviously, you know, I think there's an obvious answer to that, but really, I want to get as practical as we possibly can. Now, I understand you kind of have um, four levels or four steps or four principles of situational awareness, and I'd really, if, you, if you're willing to just talk to us now about those and how we can do our job better as sheepdogs. Sure. And um, yeah, thank you, Chris, for allowing me the opportunity to talk about this. And I have like what I call four rules of suspicious behavior. And you'll see that some of them are behavior focused, um, but a lot of them are mindset. And I think um, why me and you have become friends, Chris, is that we both see this as ministry, you know, ministry focus comes first. And I think as I talk and explain these, people will see them to be applicable in their own daily life, you know, just, just sort of templates to live by to stay safe. Because as humans, we are creatures of habits. And I think we have to build these templates in. So the first rule that I have is a mindset that suspicious behavior does not mean that something is wrong. So we, and what I mean by that is, Chris, is we have a tendency in today's world is that we, we see something that our mind is saying to us because our brains are lazy. They try to trick us. And we see things that look out of place. And we're instantly like, you know, you know about my background, former counterterrorism, former organized crime. It's very easy for me to go up here where, you know, we want to sort of stay somewhere in the orange. And even at my own church, one Sunday, Chris, I went in there and there was a suitcase outside the men's toilet. And straight away, or restroom, I should say, now being in America for 10 years, 
And straight away, my mind was thinking, well, there's a suitcase, it's out of place, we need to close down the church, you know, we need to call um, law enforcement, we need bomb squad, you know, all these crazy thoughts were going into my, my head. Because my brain was defaulting to this, this, is, this is wrong, you know, but I was, I was in a church and it was out of place, we'll talk about that in a minute. But then when I had sort of composed myself and thought about it logically, the first place I went was inside the men's restroom. And I said to the people in there, does anyone know who this suitcase belongs to? And straight away, one of the ministers that was in there raised his hand and said, I'm going to Africa straight after church. I just brought my suitcase with me. And I think that is a danger. It's a mindset that we all fall into. But just because we see something that is out of place, it doesn't mean that that behavior is wrong. It just means we've got to watch it a bit more. We've got to learn and see, see what it means. So that is my first rule. My first mindset rule is suspicious behavior does not mean that something is wrong. It could just mean in the church, Chris, that it's an opportunity to minister people. I, I, I really like that because, you know, a lot of times we do th see things that, are relatively new or, um, you know, we talked last time about, you know, when you're patrolling and as you're exposed to what's normal at your church, it gives you a better sense of what then is suspicious. And yes. then once you see that suspicious thing, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is something wrong there. It really is just a call for us to take the next step. Um, I have a friend who's, uh, he's the captain of the patrol at the Mall of America. And they were actually trained by an anti-terrorism guy from Israel. And one of the things that um, they focus on, they train their people to do is this, is if you see somebody acting in a suspicious way, it doesn't mean, you know, calling all cards, calling all cars, you know, we need to swarm, swarm, swarm. Instead, it's an invitation then, if you will, to take the next step. Like in your case, you go into the restroom and you, you know, like, hey, anyone know who owns this? You know, what is this all about? And you immediately solve the problem. I mean, instantaneously. You know, mm -hmm. as you know, when they talk, one of the things they're doing now for companies and, and schools and stuff is they talk about potential bombs, bomb threats. And back in the day, like when I was a kid, the best way to get out of a test was to call the school on a payphone and, and say there's a bomb at the school, right? And they would cancel school. They would evacuate the entire thing. And, and you kind of, as a terrorist, if you will, at that point, you know, um, you got what you wanted. You closed down the school for the day. But now they're get, the new instruction that they're giving people is this, is you get that bomb threat, and instead what you do is you have people, your employees, inspect their area because, one, they're the most familiar with that area. Also, two, if they identify a suspicious package, they're going to be the ones most likely to find it and be able to report it um, to take additional action or they're going to know no that was our amazon delivery that we normally get so you can clean up the suitcases the deliveries and all that kind of stuff and i, I think that kind of fits into what you're saying is suspicious um requires additional work and that might be exactly yeah and, and one of the things i was saying it's great and actually that um, program at the mall of america that was a program that i oversaw so i replaced michael rosen that was um the, the counterterrorism um that they replaced an israeli with a brit as well so they like the foreign nationals over there but but and here's the complexity before we move on to my, my second rule chris in house of worship and churches and the mindset is that I often say, is this person seeking grace or are they here with harmful intent? And it really ties into, um, you know, understanding um, suspicious or, or when we see unusual activity, it doesn't always mean suspicious behavior because it could be that person is displaying characteristics of someone that's broken. So it's very challenging in a house of worship, which is why I have these four rules to sort of try and sort of um, get into that as the sort of mindset of the person. Because my second rule 
and people are sort of writing this down or going to go back and listen is uh, breaking of social boundaries. Go looking for breaking of social boundaries because sometimes, and I use the Mall of America again, Chris, when I was there, people would say, well, you know, you've got behavior detection trained officers and they're looking for suspicious behavior. When you try and teach that or educate that in a church, some people would say, well, if you're, if I'm looking for suspicious behavior, is that, does that mean that the church isn't as welcoming? Am I doing the work of um, God? So what I sometimes change it to, or what I do change it to, is go looking for the breaking of social boundaries because everyone knows what those things are. And they lead you to suspicious behavior. So I'll give you an example. If anyone that is watching this video has been to my homeland in England, it is not the done thing, Chris, to look at people when you're on the London underground. You do not maintain eye contact with people. Um, and if you do that, you've broken the social boundary. You very quickly, quickly look away. I'm sure for the American audience, it's very similar in the New York on the subway. You know, you just don't hold attention with people. So you go looking for those breaking of social um, boundaries. And I'll give you an example. Again, at my church, we go back five years. Um, I was actually playing soccer. I'd snapped my Achilles tendon. I was in a cast and I was on crutches. Uh, and a woman walked in, had to get up in mid-service, made a lot of noise. And I sort of hit the, the safety officer with, with one of my crutches and said, you need to deal with this. And he said, deal with what? And then at that point, a woman was throwing things on the, on the stage. She was shouting, screaming, and the safety team had to step in and sort of remove her. And people said to me afterwards, well, Simon, how did you know that she was going to do this? And I said, well, I profiled her behavior. She broke the social boundary. She was walking into church when church was sitting down. I saw that she had some small box. I later know it was a jewelry box. I didn't know at the time, but she was walking in with a small box. And she walked further forward than one of the pastors that was seated. No one ever does that. So I didn't articulate and say that she was suspicious, Chris. I said that she broke a social boundary and straight away people could understand what that means, what it meant to them. You know, we've all been in that elevator. It's just you on your own. One other person gets in and they stand really close to you. And you're like, do I need to hold my wallet? What's going on here? You know, we're in a, you know, a six foot little square while you stood next to me. They broke the social boundary. So that's one of the mindsets that I say to people is, particularly in a church and house of worship, don't tell people to look for suspicious behavior, which is hard to contextualize. Tell them to go looking for the breaking of social boundaries and they'll use their own life skills, their own experiences to determine what those boundaries are in your church. And that's easier for them to articulate and other people to understand. And it seems less intrusive in a house of worship. Does that, that make sense, Chris? Yeah, I... I, I had never heard that before, violating social boundaries versus um, suspicious behavior. But I, 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 think I'm, I think I'm grasping it. I, I think I understand that. It's like, you sh like it, it does kind of fit into what I was saying before. The more familiar you are as a safety team member yeah. in what is normal, you know, based on observation... And then social boundaries, yeah, I'm, 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 I am kind of, <laughs> I'm kind well, of. And, 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 and here's another example. Here's what I'd say to people, because it could even be, you know, in your church on a Sunday, if you go to a Southern Baptist church, take our good friend Jimmy Meeks, they're most probably hands in the air, they're shouting, they're screaming, you know, they're, they're really excited to be in the Lord. You know, where me and you are in Minnesota, you go to like a Methodist or an Anglican church and they're very more subdued. You know, that the pastor is having to ask for an amen. Um, you know, so if someone was to stand in a church and give an amen or be very, you know, that's going to be a breaking of a social boundary to that environment because it's not the norm. And again, you're not saying that person's doing anything wrong. It's what you said earlier. That's your cue to look and say, is that a person with harmful intent or is that someone that I can help? So the breaking of social boundaries will sort of lead you down the path of the suspicious activity. Because as soon as you say suspicious behavior, suspicious activity, there can be a stigma against it. There's a breaking of a social boundary, but how can we best minister that person as to why? You know, is it because 
it's 100 degrees here in Minnesota and a person's got four jackets on. Well, no one else in the church is wearing four jackets because it's 100 degrees outside. So again, they've broken the social boundary. They're, they're, they're the sort of the where's Waldo, they're different. I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to observe. It doesn't mean, remember rule one, doesn't mean they're doing anything wrong, but I'm going to watch and observe to see, does that person have harmful intent? Um, or do they, is that someone that we can minister and to serve? Yeah, I, I, I think I really like that. I, and I can see your clock's ticking, Chris. I like Yeah, it. my, my we, brain we is brain. really kind of, you know, searching for the distinction. And I, I, I think you're right in the sense that when you say, you say that they're a suspicious behavior, you know, I think even in law enforcement, we say, you know, that person was acting, you know, suspiciously. We have to say. What does that mean? Is what I'm yeah, saying. Like, what, what was it Chris? specifically? Yeah, you know, and they'll so often like, use the "do not look right," Chris, won't they? They'll say "does not look right." So, well, well, how do you how do you how do you articulate that in a right. church? You know, and, and that's why the Mall America program that I oversaw. Yes, they have lawsuits, but most often they're unfounded because it's more than "does not look right." In a church, we have to give the qualifier. We have to say the why. Um, and, and it's for why, where people can understand and get where you are. They might not necessarily agree with you, but you can get them to. This is why in that crowd of 200 people, I spoke to that one person with the U.S. Army um, baseball cap on was for this reason. We've got to give the qualifier. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And certainly law enforcement has changed that way um, over the last five, 10 years, where it's like it's no longer about the easy, they were acting suspiciously or they weren't, you know, something was off. You have to say what it was, you know? So I think about, um, you know, working in the small town where I finished off law enforcement, you know, finding a young lady walking down the street at four o'clock in the morning, you know, two hours after the bars closed, you know, where's she going in this town? Everything's been closed for hours. Nothing's going to open for hours. You know, what is she doing here on the street or walking through, you know, yeah. the alleys at this time in the morning? You know, is she a victim of a crime? Has, has something else occurred? Is there a domestic going on? Or, or maybe she's up to no good or, or something is not right here. And so that's how I describe it is, you know, the bars have been closed for two hours. Nothing opens until six o'clock in the morning. We're at that middle point. Where, where has she come from? Where is she going? Why is she here at this time? You know, so I have a reason to pull over and say, hey, are you okay? And, and start to investigate that situation. And that really yeah. comes down to learning what's normal, right? I mean, we have to. Absolutely. You know, we can't just, one of the things that I've had troubles with some of my volunteers on is this, is they just want to sit in the sanctuary, which there's nothing wrong with that, but they just want to sit there and feel like they're doing security, well, it's not until they're patrolling the building before, during, and after the service to see what normally goes on before, during, and after. And, and then being able to recognize, hey, this is not normal. That something here, somebody's breaking the, the norms, social if you boundary. are. What'd you call that again? A break of a social boundary. Yeah. Break I'm, I'm going to trademark that, Chris, just before you start using it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's already part of my vernacular. It's going to be see, everywhere. Yeah, you use it, yeah. Well, and, and here's a good example, Chris. I'll give, you, I'll give you a live example for people to have. But even when you say the word normal, and again, you know, I think this is why me and you are friends, because we're very, very similar. And, and a lot of this is about a mindset. I say to people, expected behavior rather than saying normal, because I'll hold my hands up and say, Chris, I'm not normal. I don't know if you're normal. <laughs> There's not many people of us that are normal. I'm, I'm what is normal. So I say expected and I'll give you an example. So some people don't name these mass murderers, but I need to for context. So if we take Dylan Roof, the Charleston mass murderer, some people were saying, well, yeah, he was suspicious because he went into a black church as a white guy, you know, and sadly took the lives of nine people, including a senator and a pastor. What I would say using my concept is that he broke the social boundary. He wasn't expected in that environment because it was a predominantly African-American church. It was a midweek Bible group for people more mature than me and you, Chris, in life. And the average age of people in that Bible group, and I could be wrong because I've got no notes in front of me, I believe was 52. 
So that is why a young, white, 19-year-old kid at the time um, stuck out in the, um, the AME church in Charleston, South Carolina, was because his bro- the, bro- the breaking of social boundaries that he broke was he wasn't expected in that environment because of those profiles. And again, it's always those qualifiers. You'll hear some people just say, well, yeah, he was a young white kid going to a black church. No, it was wider than that. The average age of the person in there was 52. He was 19. You know, it was a weeknight Bible group for more mature people. He was 19. You know, yes, it was also a predominantly black church. So it's just that mindset we start getting into. When you articulate it like that, no one's ever going to really come to you and challenge. They're going to say, well, yeah, that is a bit strange. And, and then the question again in a church is someone going up to him, reaching out their hand, welcome to the AME church. Uh, you know, how can I help you today? Um, is there a group that is more in your sort of age demographic? You know, what is it that you're trying to find? Having those type of minister questions that come after after you've seen the qualifier and, you know, and the sort of like the breaking of social boundaries. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense given that it does because of people. I would imagine if somebody observed a plain clothes safety team member patrolling the grounds, that would seem, by my earlier definition, that might seem suspicious to them, but where it fits where you're saying, it's expected though. We, ex- you know, I mean, if I see somebody yeah. patrolling the grounds and I find out their safety security, well, that's an expected behavior for them as opposed to, even though it might be still qualify as suspicious, but it's expected. I get that. So yeah, yeah. what's rule number three? But yeah, and so the third one is, so I sort of re-classified um, this, if you like. I call it the worship attack cycle. So again, Chris, you might trademark these before before me. We're having a conversation now. But so, so the worship attack cycle is based off like the terrorism cycle, the crime cycle. There is um, a big cycle that all... Um, of these sort of like mass shooter incidents go through and just crime in general. And you know this as well being extra law enforcement. And you'll read afterwards that most of these people have observed the place that they've uh, attacked or done crime at. They've practiced the event beforehand. You know, generally it's not the first time they've gone in with a firearm and then they need to act. So there's six, within the worship attack cycle, there's six behaviours, if you like, that a criminal will go through to carry out one of these mass sort of shooting events or just crime in general. Um, I focus on the observe, practice and act because those are behaviours that we can see inside a house of worship. And again, I break this down. My sons are eight and 11. I break this down so they know this is, um, things as well. You know, the observe are things like persons being in the same location for an extended period of time. They are, you know, people being sort of caught in areas which are restricted or access is limited to, you know, observe our people sort of paying attention to cameras. You know, a lot of the government um, literature often talks about this, but these are real things that these mass shooters and these criminals use is that they will come to the location before an event and they'll carry out a form of observations. Now, I used to do surveillance in England. We're not talking about diving in bushes or, you know, um, sort of being in people's houses. The best place to hide when you're doing surveillance is in plain sight. So these people will come inside our houses of worship and they will be seen doing some of those activities that I've just described. Yeah, so in law enforcement, and I'm sure a lot, anyone who's watched TV, you know, it was casing the joint, right? It's the bad guys that are getting ready to knock over a bank or whatever. You know, they're, they're watching. They're doing their research. And it makes sense that terrorists would do the same thing. I mean, they're looking for the high score when it comes to casualties. And the more research they do, the more effective they're going to be. And so, yeah, coming into the church... And getting in a, a sense of what kind of security is there, or what kind of security is not yeah. there, what weaknesses they might exploit and take advantage of, and um, yeah, it makes it that that makes complete sense. That, that they, makes more sense to you than the last one, Chris. I like it. It's good. I'm getting through now. I'm getting through now. But but and here's the interesting thing, though. So we've got the observe. We've got the practice. You know, they'll, they'll come in. It's like anything as a child. I mean, you know, I was born in a single parent family. My mum didn't have much money. Occasionally I would steal from her purse. Don't hold it against me, we're all in sin. 
but my mum never caught me the first time. You know, there's always an element of practice in here. You know, so so some of these concepts we can just relate to um, to everyday everyday life. But one of the biggest things that I say to churches. You know, and I know that you spend a lot of time with small churches, just making sure you have like a notification book or, or a, a, an activity book where you can write things down. Because sometimes there's an assumption, well, I saw this unusual act. Um, I it was breaking on a social boundary. I spoke to the person. It seemed to seem to you know, be true. It could have just been that they were broken and needed some time alone in Christ. Um, but if I don't record that, when Chris comes on Wednesday for the weeknight um, youth Bible or on, on Sunday when I'm not there, he's going to take that as an isolated incident. Whereas if there's some type of just a notification book, he's going to have read when he comes on to the safety team. Oh, when Simon on Wednesday was talking to his young guy, a little bit out of place in here for an extended period of time. They had a conversation. The guy said he was looking for Christ again. But here he is now again on Sunday displaying the same behaviors you know it's not isolated um does my thought process and decision change knowing that behavior has been twice so particularly around the observe and the practice we've really got to make sure that we're logging things down and there's some type of notification within the church because one off could just be someone who's in human brokenness you see it twice i see there's someone we nearly really need to help or we might have to escalate and work out okay what is the real reason behind them sort of being in here for an extended period of time, being found in that room. Um, does that make sense, Chris? Oh, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we push in our safety team fundamentals course is our patrol log. And that is a way of passing on different interactions and different things that we've done. Now, it could be as simple as I checked all the fire extinguishers. They're good to go. I initialed off on them. We're good for this month. So that way, nobody, everyone knows that they don't need to follow up on that. But it includes more of that, like those little contacts. Um, I found out we, in a previous church, in my previous church, there was the same couple that was showing up in our parking lot on a regular basis. Now, in the end, they were just there for the Wi-Fi, um, which is okay. You know, no big deal. But by the time I started talking to, you know, wrote it down and talking to team mm -hmm. members, I actually had team members say, yo, yeah, I saw them last Sunday when you weren't here. And then, oh, yeah, I saw them two, three weeks ago or a month ago. And so, yeah, you know, recording those kind of interactions, because how else do you build that pattern? Another yeah. one is just like uh, other volunteers that might be violating the rule. So, you know, we had a we had a back door to the children's area. So we have all the security on all sides, but this back door is the back door, right? And, you know, you catch it propped open and you think it's a one-off, but maybe there's, you know, it's not until we see it three, four times and we've talked to the same volunteer three, four times that it's like, listen, time out. Now we have to take additional action the talking no longer works. Now we need to, you know, either bring it to the ministry, you know, children's ministry director or leadership or whatever in order to fix this problem. And that's where that, that patrol log is what we call it, but it's that pass on book. So we can start recognizing those differences. And I think if anything, this gives me another reason to encourage safety team members, fill it out. Even if you think it's just a yeah. small little thing, you know, right Write what you did, the person or you, the suspicious, uh, I'm sorry, the... Oh, Breaking of social I, boundaries. Not, what is it again? Breaking of social boundaries. Breaking of social boundaries. I need to write that down so I can trademark it before you do. That's Breaking yeah. social boundaries. Uh, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Oh, no, um, just, someone else, if you don't, Chris, someone else will do beforehand. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's true. And actually, you know, and I've got a real life example for you. So people write this one down and you can put this in the link below in your, your channel as well. So Kyle Odom. I think Carl Odin was 2017. He's a former Marine, suffered from mental illness, um, master's degree, very clever guy. I believe at the time of this incident, he was considering doing a, a doctorate. You can see he's a very clever guy. Um, but he fell into mental illness. He saw the pastor, Tim Remington, speak at a 2016 presidential, um, they're on, a, I think it's a Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz rally, he saw the pastor Tim Remington and said, that's, uh, that's a marshal, um, that's a marshal, I need to go and kill that person. And he went to the church two or three times before the Sunday where he, he pre presented himself to the pastor in the parking lot, shot him at point blank range 
by an act of God, the pastor survived. I mean, Tim Remington, incredible um, guy. Now he advocates for safety and security, but he was shot point blank range in a parking lot by a Marine. I mean, you can't get more of a, you know, he's trying to kill, you can't get more of a, a God sort of um, God message than that. But Carl Odom had been in that church two or three times before. On the day of the attack, he arrives like 6.30 in the morning. He shoots a pastor like 2.30 in the afternoon. So there, there's these big warning signs where people put the story together afterwards saying, well, yeah, he'd been in here before. They hadn't filled in their log. Yeah. But what you've always got to do, Chris, always got to do, and you know this and teach this, is you have to be proactive. And in a church, that can be as much as reaching out your hand, welcome to Westwood Community Church, what brings you here today, holding that conversation with them, looking in the whites of their eyes, what brings them here today? You know, when you go and get your hair cut, they'll ask you in the barber, you know, what brings you here? How can I help you? Well, I'm in a barber, so I want my, I want my afro cut, of course, but they're asking you the question because they want you to, you to tell them it's that sales technique. So we should never be afraid. We have to be proactive. And that is the flip side of having that, um, that log. When you see a repeated behavior or see something that's out of place, you've got to interact with that person. Because if nothing else, Chris, you know this, that could be a person that you can minister to. 95% of what you're doing in security ministry is ministering to someone. You know, it's, you, you're doing them a disadvantage. If you actually see those breaking the social boundaries, you don't work out, is that person okay? How can I serve you best, best today? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, so, so the number fourth four. One, yeah. And, and the fourth one then, so the fourth one, again, so these are all mindsets, but if you go back, listen to this, and hopefully you can link to, to each one within the notes. This one is trust God for your instinct for things to be out of place. So what we do as humans in and around unusual activity, breaking of social boundaries, we try and contextualize it. Oh, well, that's maybe that's just... Um, this is going on. I'm not really seeing that, but that's okay. Maybe someone else is going to step in. You know, our brain is lazy and we see these things and we dismiss them and push them away. And, and time and time again, history has shown us that when we do that, that's when harmful things happen. And I'll give you an example when I'm going to come back to the God um, piece. And I forget the young guy's name is going to come to me, but it was Boston Marathon bombing in 2013. Um, no, his name has really gone from my brain. <laughs> Should have written it down. But there was uh, Jeff Bauman's his name. I knew it was going to come back. So Jeff Bauman was a 19-year-old Costco worker at the finish line of the Boston Marathon, waiting for his girlfriend to run, I believe, her first marathon. He saw the two brothers that carried out the Boston Marathon bombing. And he said afterwards that the guilt that he feels is that all he had to do was go to one of those 300 police officers and say, these two people are breaking social boundaries because everyone's looking at the finishing line, they're looking in the other direction. Everyone's there in light clothes, they've got these heavy backpacks. All he had to do was go to those 300 police officers or more and tell them. But the reality is, it isn't that easy because how we're programmed we tend to dismiss things like that, you know, and sadly for that young man now in his 20s, he has that on his conscience. What would have happened if I'd gone to one of his police officers? So how I tie that into Chris is us as Christians is that I believe that I was created by a higher power. And then I believe that when I have an emotion or a feeling or something goes wrong, what I ask myself, I don't challenge and say, well, am I being prejudiced towards that person? What would God say about me approaching this person? What would God say that this person's got a backpack and I'm about to go and talk to them? What I say to myself is, God created me. God gave me those emotions. What is he trying to communicate to me right now? When the hairs stand up on the back of your, your, your neck, when the hairs stand up on your hands, when your, you know, your, your palms go sweating, what is our sort of Lord and Savior trying to communicate to us? We have to trust that and take action. The biggest thing you find in houses of worship is people dismiss these behaviors, but we believe we're created by God. What is God trying to communicate to you in that moment in time? Oh. It's a deep one, that last one we ended on, Chris. Deep, very deep one. <laughs> that, that is very deep. And, you know, I, I've shared before how easy it is to dismiss things um 
even when the evidence is so boldly in your face. I told the story of the guy who um, ran over somebody on the highway early in the morning. It's dark out. And he, when he pulled over and he called 911, his report to the dispatcher was, um, I just hit a deer, but it was wearing pants. So his brain is working very hard to dismiss what he saw and yeah. what he experienced. Yeah. And now that's an extreme situation, obviously, but we really do do that. We, we, want it, we see some um, violation of, you know, of social norms, behavior that violates social norms. Mm or whatever. <laughs> See, I, I still haven't memorized it. To, that's good. So you can't trademark it. You can't trademark it. That's good. But no, I mean, it's a good, I mean, but we do make those excuses. We make those, we don't want to believe what we're seeing. We really don't want to do that. And somehow as safety team members, as sheepdogs, we need to learn to pay attention to those things. We need to, it's our job to perk up to those things. And as you said, you know, God called us into this. If you at all feel like this is your ministry, that you are a safety team member, you are a sheepdog, that means we have to sharpen those skills of paying attention to those minor, those, those things, those, those behaviors, those actions, those violation of, uh, of, of expect, you know, social expectations and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, and then take some sort of action. You know, I, I think that really isn't that really what a sheepdog is. You know, the whole reason I do safety ministry is because I want the rest of the congregation to get up that morning, get ready, have breakfast, jump in their cars, drive to church, sit at during the sermon, get some praying done, some worship done, maybe participate in a Bible study and children's ministry and all that kind of stuff. And then when it's all over, I want them to get back in their cars and I want them to drive home and have almost no thought about safety and security because they know they're surrounded by sheepdogs, you know. And while I wish everyone was aware and paying attention, don't get me wrong there, I'm just saying realistically, that's, that's our calling. That's what we're there for. We're not there worrying about what the song is that's going to be sung. We're not worried. We're not there to worry about what the pastor is going to say necessarily. We're there for a very specific purpose. We have a very specific calling. And that means we have to have a different mindset that's sharp, paying attention, and taking action when it needs to be taken. Yeah, and that's a right. And I believe, you know, and I taught this for um seven eight years now this concept you know but i believe if you and i've got to look at my notes to remind myself because i'm getting old but if you go for you know suspicious behavior does not mean that anything is wrong that's your opportunity to see things be proactive and minister you know go looking for the breaking of social boundaries it's going to alert you to things that are different in your environment that's your opportunity to minister when you see those you know, the worship attack cycle is the cycle that criminals will go through before I carry out a criminal act. There is, they are going to observe, they're going to practice, and they're going to act. The observe and practice is your chance, again, to intervene and disrupt, and also vote, find those people that can minister. A father who's down on his luck, who has no money, who's living in his car, there's a court injunction that he can't see his wife and kids. He's going to hover in the corridors asking for $10 because he can't eat that night, so he's embarrassed to ask. His behaviours could be very similar to someone who's going to come in and burglarise it. So again, it's your opportunity to act, you know, and trust your instinct for things that look out of place. God created us, as you just said, Chris. If people don't understand our world, that's okay. But I say, what is God trying to communicate to me when hairs are standing up on the back of my head or I just feel uneasy in the, in the situation? He is trying to give me a message um, and just acknowledge that message and then then sort of work work through it. So, Chris, as always, it's been great to um, spend some time with you, um, talk, share, share ideas and steal ideas from each other. So, Well, the, yeah, and your, your summary is absolutely perfect. And it's another good example for everybody out there of how safety team members, sheepdogs need to have these regular 
conversations, these discussions, because we can always learn more from each other. Simon, everything you said, some, I mean, it was some of it challenging, great ideas, very helpful. And I feel like I'm going to be a better sheepdog for it. And uh, I'm sure our listeners are going to be better sheepdogs for it. So thank you so much again. This was awesome. I don't know why this doesn't become a regular thing because you know, you know a great deal. And I love your approach and, and what you've done and what you're doing. And so I'll cut you loose here in a couple seconds. But once again, people, hey, Worship Security Association, find it. Check the link below. Click on it. Go over there. Check it out. I'm telling you, Simon knows what he's talking about. And when he doesn't know what he's talking about, he interviews people smarter than him, which is what I'm all about too. Surround your people, surround yourself with people smarter than you, and you're going to keep moving forward and improving your team. So thank you so much for tuning in today. And hey, let's be careful out there. This program is made for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice.